he learnt uh, the necessity of good supply system at that time. He created an intelligence system. His great contribution also was he was a tremendous trainer of infantry. And also, he laid down very strict guidelines for the welfare of the soldiers, that they should be properly clothed, properly fed, uh, properly trained. And this, of course, paid tremendous dividends later on. One character trait that surfaced in India and would stay with him forever was a seeming distrust of other people's advice. Usually he checked on everybody the whole time. He was, could not really believe very many people giving him complete trust. He tended to know everything himself. Wellington always found a way to beat his enemy. He's gonna say that everything he needed to know in fighting a battle, he learned in India. He learns that in each different campaign, he has to come about it in a different manner. His success in protecting British trade interests in India was spectacular. He was awarded knighthood for his efforts. Across the Alps in Italy in 1796, Napoleon's army sought out and clashed with enemy troops who were still trying to force France to restore its pre-revolution monarchy. Foremost among these foes were the armies of Austria and Piedmont. His campaign began with a rocky start, for he found his army ill-fed, ill-equipped, ill-paid, and undermanned. Not to mention the fact that some of the officers he was commanding were nearly twice his age and had twice the experience. Yet these obstacles did not seem to bother him. Napoleon had great belief in himself and his own ability. In Italy, he used this and he used every shot in his arsenal of uh, man management, cajoling, persuading, being extremely friendly with people, being very harsh with people, screaming at them. Whatever it took to get the man to follow him, and this magic worked, it was what we would call today perhaps star quality. He did things that no one else could do because he was who he was. The ragged army began to turn around. All who saw him could see that he was a general who was going to go on the ride of a lifetime. And he made them feel as if they were going to go along too. Just like Wellington, Napoleon was obsessed with theories of battle. Now the time had come for him to put his concepts into practice. Leading many of the charges himself, he defied long-held military convention and revolutionized the rules of war forever. Before war had been a gentleman's game. Two armies line up on a field and they pound away at each other until one side gives. Uh, not Napoleon. He's not going to take it while the other side's giving it. He's going to force it all upon the enemy. He divides their forces, crushes one wing, and then goes after the other. It's not like anybody has seen before. Everything he did was innovative. Everything he did worked. And in less than a year, he defeated four armies, each larger than his own. In India, Wellington also continued to go from victory to victory. Yet rather than the euphoria that came over Napoleon after winning, Wellington seemed to have a cloud of melancholy descend upon him after each victory. Few would call him emotional. But the price in human lives that was paid for each of his successes truly seemed to affect him. Although he had become a master of war, he seemed acutely aware of the inherent tragedy that accompanied his chosen profession. Victory affected Napoleon differently. His fabulous success in Italy fueled even more his belief that his life was different, that he was somehow touched with a greater destiny than that of any other man. In the midst of one battle, he seemed to glimpse the future. I saw the world spin away beneath me as if I were born up in the air. Napoleon Bonaparte. 
At this time, Napoleon was getting a, a great view of himself as something above the crowd. To an extent, he was believing his own publicity, but he knew that he could do things that other people couldn't. He had a vision that he was not subject to the rules of ordinary men and that he could mold France and eventually mold Europe to his vision of the ideal society with of course himself as the head. In his personal life though he was not the conquering hero. Madly in love, he was puzzled by his wife's lack of response to the letters he sent home. Unknown to him was the fact that back in Paris, Josephine was having numerous affairs. Before leaving Italy, Napoleon spread some of the French Revolution's reforms and then returned home. Now one of France's greatest national heroes. Some thought he could do anything by this time. And an invasion of France's mortal enemy, Britain, was considered. But he wisely sidestepped the task and instead turned his eye to invading Egypt. If conquered, it would help destroy England's commerce with the Middle East and jeopardize their trade routes to India. Egypt, that most mysterious of all lands. He was already aware, of course, of its fabled past. For centuries, the greatest of all nations in the ancient world. The land of the pharaohs. The land of the pyramids. The land of the Nile. The land his hero, Alexander the Great, had conquered over 2,000 years earlier. Like Wellington in India, Napoleon relished the thought of military service in an exotic land. He reached Egypt in July of 1798 and quickly took Alexandria. Then, in the spectacular Battle of the Pyramids, he destroyed additional Egyptian forces in a matter of two hours. But although he was a conqueror and a soldier of fortune, here in Egypt, he was also a scholar with a great reverence toward the culture. Those who saw him described almost a euphoric spell the land cast over him. His actions here clearly showed both sides of his complex personality. The magic land had such a tremendous pull on his intellectual nature that before leaving France, he had assembled a second army to accompany him. But this one was not meant for fighting. He's also taken an army of scientists, of philosophers, to go and study the Orient. Uh, this is the, the land that the knowledge has come from. And so Napoleon is bent on recovering some of that knowledge. Uh, these scientists and philosophers are working throughout the land finding all kinds of great riches that will come back and enlighten all of Europe. One of the things they find is the Rosetta Stone now in the British Museum in London. Uh, this stone allowed us to decipher all the hieroglyphs in Egypt which had remained undecipherable for hundreds of years. The euphoria of Egypt was short-lived though. Word reached him that back in Europe a new coalition of Austria, Britain and Russia had formed against France threatening the Republic, he decided to return to Paris. At the same time, and perhaps even more devastating to him, he learned of Josephine's infidelity. Her affairs were public knowledge on the streets of Paris, yet Napoleon truly seemed to be the last to know. His friends finally confronted him with the news. The effect was shattering. Deeply disillusioned, he wrote to his favorite brother, Joseph. The veil has been horribly torn asunder. You are the only person remaining to me. I am weary of human nature. I need to be alone and isolated. All feeling is dried up. Napoleon Bonaparte. Incredibly, the situation got worse when the letter was intercepted at sea by Britain's Admiral Nelson. It was published in the London newspapers, and Napoleon became the laughingstock of Europe. Heartsick, he returned to France, seeking a divorce. This scandal and the threat of divorce caused Josephine to reconsider the marriage. Threatened with losing the relationship, 
she realized now how important it was to her. Her plea for forgiveness and Napoleon's fear of losing contact with her children, who he now loved as his own, caused him to decide to give the marriage another try. In India, Wellington watched as Napoleon rose to glory, perceiving every one of Bonaparte's accomplishments as a potential threat to England. In time, the British began planning an invasion force that would throw out the French troops Napoleon had left in Egypt. Wellington pulled all strings to get appointed to this task force. It's ironic that right before he was set to sail for Egypt, he came down with a serious fever and could not make the voyage. The ship he was to travel on got caught in a storm at sea and went down with all hands. This random tragedy at the hand of fate left the door open for the two men to clash at a later date. In France, people were rapidly losing faith in their government. After over 10 years of revolution and civil disorder, they wanted a strong leader, someone to calm the waters. Napoleon had performed miracles on the battlefield. Perhaps he could deliver them also in government the people were looking for a saber that would cut them free of the turmoil. He was the obvious one to wield it. Forming key political alliances and with the threat of force, he seized control of the government with a bloodless coup on November 9th, 1799, becoming the first consul of France, a post that carried with it near dictatorial powers. Characteristically, he threw himself into the experience with the same ferocity with which he marched into battle. The ox has been harnessed. Now it must plow, he said. By force of will, he created himself. Now he turned that same unyielding will on changing the face of France forever. Give France new laws, abolish serfdom, uh, bringing in religious toleration. It was as if the sponge of a brain that had been absorbing things for years suddenly was being squeezed. And all of these classical ideas and modern ideas and ideas that were completely fresh and new and were Napoleon's own were coming out together. And he was directing the gullies down which they flowed. And they flowed throughout France. His physical and intellectual stamina were amazing. At the Fontainebleau Palace, he had his desk moved into his bedroom so he could get up in the middle of the night and work. Often he dictated to as many as six secretaries at a time, jumping from subject to subject and never losing his place. His eye for detail impressed all, as did his decisive nature. The two questions he constantly asked the most were, is it useful? Is it just? His relationship with Josephine began to sweeten. The relationship with Josephine got a lot better because Josephine, of course, was getting what she wanted. She had always been very much uh, socially connected, interested in beautiful things. Her husband was now head of the French government. She was, to all intents and purposes, first lady of France. So she was in the prime social position. Napoleon was getting the ideal mate for his head of state. A refined taste came at a high price. Napoleon once said she was a woman who could master the art of extravagance. But the changes she encouraged along with his approval left their stamp on France for centuries to come. Paris became the elite of European capitals. Their private moments were spent at their country estate of Malmaison. It was a retreat. It wasn't one of the, the big state palaces. It was, to all intents and purposes, Napoleon and Josephine's family home. And it's very grand and beautifully appointed 
Malmaison is, is, is very much Josephine's house, and um, her original name, of course, was Rose, and she has roses planted all over the gardens, which are still maintained. Her imprint was all over it. The only room that seemed to bear Napoleon's stamp was the study. From here, he planned his new world order. The success of the changes he made in France became the envy of much of the world. Even Beethoven wrote the Eroica Symphony and dedicated it to him. Napoleon is looked upon by Europe and, and many throughout the world as, as a great hero in this period. The changes that he uh, brings to France are, are the envy of all democratic-minded peoples. And so you have Beethoven in, in Vienna and others uh, in, throughout the Germanies who are looking to France for leadership uh, in what they see from the rights and promise of the French Revolution. It's for the common man. And Napoleon seems to be uh, the savior uh, of the, the revolution, of the principles of the revolution. But there was always the paradox of Napoleon. On one hand, he was the prince of peace. On the other hand, he played the god of war, enlightening his neighbors and enemies to his progressive policies at the point of a bayonet. He was the ruler of France, but he never ceased to be a soldier. Always in the name of peace, always in the name of the revolution, French armies marched out and dominated Europe. He often described himself as an eagle soaring above the clouds, but his enemies called him a tiger let loose to devour mankind. In India, Wellington continued to watch and wait. Like many, he sensed it was only a matter of time before Bonaparte went too far. His instincts were right. Bonaparte's genius would soon turn to megalomania, and the world would turn to Wellington to stop him. Yet the picture seemed too perfect. Napoleon, at the height of his glory, appeared almost superhuman. Epic accomplishments, worldwide fame, hero worship on a massive scale, and yet... I think Napoleon was a notorious cheater. In games, Napoleon would, might claim that something was inbounds when he knew full well that it wasn't. Uh, he might violate some rules of the games because he could win. Napoleon would do everything that he could to win, uh, even if it meant violating rules. Once he reached his objective, once he won the game, then I think he was willing to admit that uh, he maybe had used a devious path in getting there. But the important thing for Napoleon was to win. Was he not the master of the impossible? His whole life had been guided by stopping at nothing to attain his goals. On December 2nd, 1804, the world turned its eyes to Paris and Notre Dame Cathedral. Napoleon, as always, in center stage, further consolidated his power when he became Emperor of France. For centuries, imperial coronations had been presided over by the Pope. But at his coronation, Napoleon took the crown himself and placed it on his own head. To many, this marked the point where he started to go out of control. He was only 35 years old. The French people and the Senate had approved this change in status. But to many, it seemed an affront. Hadn't the French Revolution been fought in part to overthrow a monarchy? And now he was bringing in another. In this phase, he seems to be going against a lot of the precepts of the French Revolution, especially as seen by a lot of the intelligent people around the continent. Beethoven, for example, who'd written his great masterpiece, the Eroica, for Napoleon, tears it up in disgust when he finds that Napoleon has crowned himself an emperor. Once in power, once with that crown firmly upon his head in all the trappings, of an emperor, uh, I think it began to work on his psyche and maybe it, it started him down that path uh, to Waterloo. No one knows Wellington's reaction to the coronation, but like all British subjects, the thought of more power in Bonaparte's hands must have seemed like an imminent threat. More and more Napoleon's troops marched out of Paris and across Europe as he put most of the continent under his thumb. Securing under French control Italy and the Germanies, Napoleon brings those 
precepts and freedoms uh, of the French Revolution to the people, but at the same time, he brings his garrisons of troops. And as the years go by, uh, those become harder and harder to bear. Tribute must be paid for their upkeep. Napoleon doesn't do anything for free, and so with these freedoms comes a monetary price, and so as the years go by, that becomes a heavy price to pay, and so many of these nations then are going to be willing, when the time is right, uh, to join forces to overthrow the French yoke. His French empire was now the greatest in Europe since the Roman Empire. In 1805, Wellington finally set sail from India to England. On the journey home, his ship had to stop over for provisions at the island of St. Helena in the South Atlantic. This is the island Napoleon would be banished to at the end of his life. Ironically, Wellington stayed in the same house Napoleon temporarily lived in while waiting for his main house to be prepared. He continued on to England. On September 10th, 1805, he stepped onto British soil for the first time in nearly a decade. He had left the mother country under a cloud, but now he was a spectacular success, returning with a knighthood, fame, and an income in keeping with his new status. Not a man to take defeat lightly. He still had not gotten over the fact that Catherine Packenham's family had rejected him. And he still had not gotten over her, even though they had not seen each other for 10 years. Uncharacteristically, this most calculating of men made a huge blunder concerning this affair of the heart. Sight unseen, he asked by letter for her hand in marriage. This chivalrous enterprise was a disaster when she accepted. And he sees his bride-to-be coming up the, uh, the aisle. He has not seen her for 10 years. And here's this, this woman that he, he's now remembered as being the most beautiful woman in Ireland. And he turns to his brother Gerald and says, my God, she's grown so ugly over the years. It's, it's incredulous almost that, that this man who'd been so careful in his military planning had not properly planned out his own wedding. Wellington, forever a man of his word, followed through with the wedding. But the marriage, by most accounts, was a disaster. Added to this disappointment was the fact that his career now stagnated as he waited for his next big assignment. By 1809, Napoleon became concerned about what would happen to his vast empire after his death. Josephine was now 46 years old and had produced no heirs. Theirs had blossomed into a great romance, but France and his overwhelming ambition were his true mistresses. Everything else had to be pushed aside to serve them. He decided to have the marriage annulled and to marry a younger woman who could produce an heir. They'd been together for 14 years. She begged him to rethink the decision. She pleaded. Finally, when she saw his decision was final, she relented. On December 15th, 1809, she passed out of his life, returning alone to Ma Maison. He replaced her with the 18-year-old Archduchess of Austria, Marie Louise, daughter of Emperor Francis I. In 1811, she gave birth to a son, also named Napoleon, who was given the title King of Rome. More people now began to seriously question whether Napoleon, for all his success, had betrayed the revolution. One of the flaws in men of genius is that they began to think of themselves as a special race of humans who don't have to deal with these ordinary humans who get in the way of doing things, who, are, who, who waffle here and there, who are never steadfast, who seem to have second-rate minds. So Napoleon is now diminishing everyone around him. And in that process, you have this superego. It is the, the ego of a genius. In the words of the great Lord Acton, many decades later, power does corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. His megalomania even went so far as to have France's great national treasure, the Mona Lisa, moved temporarily from the Louvre to his home, where he could view it every day by himself. 
He would always say, I have never been my own master. I have always been governed by circumstances. If this was true, then most of those circumstances were forced on him by the British, his own ego, and now, finally, major errors in judgment. Outwardly, he appeared invincible, going from triumph to triumph. But buried within this maze of glory was a cancerous mistake, one that slowly began to eat away at the grand design of his dream. It was known as the Continental System, and involved the ever-present rivalry and hatred between France and Great Britain. Britain, with its brilliant military commanders like Wellington, was forever the thorn in Napoleon's side. For although he controlled most of Europe, Britain controlled the seas. With her far-flung empire stretching all over the globe, she had every bit the muscle and the capital to defy him. Thinking he could bring them to their knees by paralyzing their economy, he introduced the Continental System. This barred British ships from all ports under French control, and also barred neutral nations from carrying British goods to the European continent. In many ways, this one dictate amongst the thousands he had made would be the beginning of the end for him. It's gonna fail. And it's gonna fail because those people who he's closing it off, the Germans, the Italians, the Russians, the Austrians, the Spanish, it hurts them as much, if not more, than it hurts the English. And so these people who he supposedly has allied himself with are extremely unhappy with this system that he's imposed on them against their will. Allies and foes conspired to beat the system. There was too much money on the line. Smuggling and blockade running became prevalent. This conflict finally ignited into total war with Portugal and Spain. Now Wellington's time of waiting was over. Here was the new big command he had been dreaming of. Here was his chance to go up against Napoleon. In 1808, Spain, Portugal, and England joined forces against France. Into this picture now came Wellington, who was put in command of the alliance against Napoleon. He and Napoleon never met in combat in Spain. Instead, he faced some of Bonaparte's best commanders. Constantly, he got the upper hand, pushing the French farther and farther off the Iberian Peninsula. In the process, he studied French warfare, learning all their tactics, and he also became an expert at hiding his troops behind the reverse slopes of hills. This experience would prove invaluable at Waterloo. His men's confidence in him was unwavering, yet everyone kept their distance. It wasn't popular, by the way. It's a question of being respected rather more than liked. There's a big difference on that. Whereas Napoleon, of course, tried to chat with the other ranks. He believed in that to be friend to friend. Not your Duke of Wellington later on. He was slightly the Lord. So he was in charge, and that is no doubt. Like Napoleon, he was also fearless in battle. Both men seemed to live charmed lives. So successful was Wellington in Spain and Portugal that Napoleon came to call the problem his Spanish ulcer. It had taken Napoleon little more than a decade to build his empire, yet it's surprising how quickly it came unraveled after the first setbacks. With Wellington hammering away at his troops in Spain and Portugal, and with other alliances forming against him in Europe, he made the catastrophic blunder of invading Russia in 1812. It was here the fates turned on him. For the brutal Russian winter engulfed his army and decimated it as no human foe had ever done. Over half his troops were lost. Now in a vulnerable state, he returned to Europe. His enemies were waiting for him. At the Battle of Leipzig, he overwhelmed his weakened army. 
In Spain, Wellington finished the job by pushing the remainder of his troops completely off the Iberian Peninsula. For this, England bestowed on him the title Duke of Wellington. Napoleon was completely stunned by these failures. Fortune had smiled on him so often that he couldn't believe she ever might be completely unfaithful. With Allied troops now on the outskirts of Paris, he retreated to Fontainebleau and contemplated what before had been the unthinkable. In this room, he spent what was probably the longest night of his life. In 1812, Napoleon had a potion made up of poison in case the worst possible fate, you know, befell him. And generally, the worst possible fate did befall him. So he goes now to this old poison, and he takes it. What has happened? The poison has lost its potency. And instead, he's just violently sick, but lives. In a way, this was the final insult. He couldn't even commit suicide. On April 11th, 1814, Napoleon abdicated the imperial throne. The Allies oversaw the return of a king of the Bourbon family and placed Louis XVIII in power. The revolution now had come full circle. Down these steps in front of Fontainebleau, Napoleon marched. He made a cheerful goodbye to his troops and then set off to exile on the island of Elba in a remote corner of the Mediterranean Sea. He was not through, though. The leopard can't change its spots. And in Napoleon's mind, he couldn't ever conceive of losing. Legend has it that he said he would return to France when the violets bloomed. It had taken a force of nature as great as the savage Russian winter to bring Napoleon to his knees. But in human terms, it was clear to all the man who had softened Bonaparte up was Wellington. Although he had never fought Napoleon, his army had outbattled and outfoxed and outmaneuvered the best of Napoleon's marshals, proving to all the world that France was not invincible. With Napoleon now on Elba, the yoke of his tyranny thrown off, worldwide attention now focused on Wellington. For all of those who had ever hated Napoleon, Wellington became the embodiment of the shining knight who had slain the biggest dragon of all. Hero worship and idolization followed him at every turn. Characteristically, he was distrusting and suspicious of all the attention. Well, I don't think he was a great man for, for adulation. He didn't take much notice of what people said or did or about him you know didn't, he didn't uh, particularly care for mine one way or the other with napoleon banished to elba the conquering hero wellington entered paris as the new british ambassador to france in the blink of an eye the great adventure seemed to be over for bonaparte elba was a remote poverty-stricken speck of an island off the coast of Italy. The combined European powers decreed that this was where the eagle would be caged, perhaps for eternity. They were wrong. Almost from the moment Bonaparte left France, things started to go bad for Louis XVIII. The French people had become strongly attached to the essential achievements of the revolution. Now, with Louis in power, Everything seemed to be going backwards. Old hatreds were revived. Resistance organized and conspiracies hatched. Soon the attention of France started turning back to Napoleon. Bonaparte felt if he could get back to Paris, perhaps he could exploit the situation. He saw his chance for escape come when the British commissioner in charge of his captivity left the island for a brief trip to Italy. With great cunning, Napoleon took command of seven small ships and with his personal guard of a thousand men, slipped away from the island and set sail for the homeland. He had been on Elba just 11 months and true to his word, the violets were blooming in France. Bonaparte, 
had always taken risks. This was the greatest gamble of his life. He wasn't sure what to expect. Was the information he'd been given correct? Was his timing right? Would the people of France welcome him back? And how would he topple Louis's great armies with just a tiny force of a thousand men? On March 1st, 1815, he landed on the coast of France and started marching with his troops towards Paris. So uncertain and cautious was he that he chose to go the long, hard way through the Alps rather than through Provence, which he believed to have royalist sentiments. In Vienna at this time, Wellington was attending a Congress of Allies. He was one of the first at the meeting to get word of Napoleon's daring escape. When it was announced to the assembly, at first they were shocked, and then some burst out laughing. Most were convinced Bonaparte's desperate effort was doomed, and that he would immediately be engulfed by enemies. It was Napoleon who would do the laughing, though. What happened next was perhaps the most amazing event of his already amazing life. As Napoleon marched through the Alps, any doubts he had about how France would receive him were wiped away. All along his path, jubilant people began showing up. Soon men started volunteering to march with him. In Paris, Louis received word of his return. At first he was disbelieving, then he thought perhaps Napoleon had gone mad. Nevertheless, he sent armies out to intercept him. Yet back in the Alps, conspiracy was in the air. Napoleon's small army climbed higher and higher into the mountains, through snow-clogged valleys and freezing colds. Finally, on the roof of Europe, he met the first troops Louis had sent to stop him. The stage was now set for the most dramatic performance of his life. Unarmed, he walked out in front of the king's army and addressed them. Soldiers who uh, were sent to oppose him cannot withstand his personality. He stands in front of them alone, exposes his breast and says, if you will shoot your emperor, go ahead. None of them do. No one even thinks about it. They swarm to his colors. His numbers grow. Anyone sent to oppose him falls under his sway. He continued on toward Paris. From 1,000 men, now a sea of soldiers marched behind him. A joke at the time claimed Napoleon had sent a message to the king. My dear brother, there is no need to send more troops. I already have enough. Napoleon Bonaparte. Like a thief in the night, Louis fled the country. On March 20th, just 20 days after landing on the coast, Napoleon marched into Paris, once again the ruler of France. In the street, there was pandemonium as jubilant crowds surrounded him. To many, it was as if he had returned from the dead. The impossible had been accomplished. He had recaptured the entire country without a drop of French blood being spilled. At the Congress of Vienna, those who had laughed at Napoleon's daring venture now became alarmed. They were shocked and outraged when told of the success of his miracle march. It was as if the devil himself had escaped and was on the loose. The Tsar of Russia was one step ahead of the rest. He knew what was coming. He turned to Wellington and referring to the Duke's great success in Spain, exclaimed with extreme seriousness. It is up to you to save the world again, Tsar Alexander the First. Immediately upon his return, Napoleon made overtures to his European neighbors, indicating his desire for peace. They didn't believe him. Almost immediately, the call went out for an allied army of a million men to be raised to march on France and eliminate him forever. This made his next course of action clear. 
His only hope was to raise his own army faster than they and score a decisive victory before they could get organized. Showing flashes of his old brilliance, he once again attempted the impossible and succeeded. By June 1st, less than three months after reclaiming the throne, he had a standing army in place, ready to march, many of them veterans of his previous campaigns. Napoleon's intelligence network reported that in next door Belgium, British, Prussian, and Belgian troops were gathering for the forthcoming invasion of France. The Prussian and British forces were by far the largest contingents. Wellington had been placed in command of the British troops. Napoleon knew he must move now before his enemies gained any more strength. With lightning speed, his troops marched into Belgium under a cloak of secrecy and darkness. With unbelievable stealth, uh, his army is moved to the frontier within miles of his enemies without them even knowing that he's there. Luck was with him. The location of the British and Prussian armies played right into his hands. The two armies were separated by dozens of miles. The Prussian army was 120,000 troops strong, the British 100,000. Together, their combined forces could easily beat his 125,000. But when separated, as they were now, he could move in and defeat one army and then turn around and face the other one separately. He felt his seasoned troops were vastly superior to their quickly thrown together forces. It was a perfect strategic situation for him offering a classic Napoleonic battle plan of divide and conquer. On June 16th, in a prelude to the Battle of Waterloo, Napoleon's forces clashed with the Prussians in the small Belgian town of Ligny. The Prussian army was under the command of Field Marshal Gephard Blücher. Blücher, of course, was well into his 70s, hard drinking, uh, lo loves women, loves life. Uh, he, he, he breaks the rules. When he gives his word, that's his bond. Blucher really felt a great shame when Prussia was conquered by Napoleon. He hated Napoleon. He hated everything French. That day, the French troops badly mauled the Prussians. In the process, Marshal Blücher barely escaped death and capture when his horse was shot from under him. Here he is, 76 years old, ends up being knocked off his horse, or rather knocked under his horse. His horse is lying on him. He is ridden over by his own men and some of the French. Um, he is then, uh, you know, his, his men get back to him. They pick him up, he douses himself with gin, rubs it all over himself, and immediately wants to be back in action. At the same time, Napoleon had sent Marshal Ney to contain the British who were holding the important crossroads at the nearby village of Quatre Bras. For years, Ney had been one of Napoleon's greatest commanders, known to all as the bravest of the brave. But here in Belgium, Ney stumbled badly. History has never been able to explain fully why Ney was so indecisive about engaging the British here. Wellington's troops were not in full strength, and if Ney had acted swiftly and with more force, the French could easily have routed them. Instead, he cautiously engaged them. Some believe it was Wellington's spectacular reputation for being cagey that caused this hesitancy. Wellington had outsmarted the French at every turn in Spain, and Ney may have been concerned about marching headlong into one of Wellington's traps. By not making a decisive assault on the British here, it allowed Wellington to begin a maneuver back to a piece of ground he knew he could make a stand on. The battlefield he had in mind was near a town called Waterloo.
furious about Ney's failure to contain the British. On June 17th, along with Ney's army, he headed off in pursuit of Wellington. Had they caught Wellington and fought him on that day, the odds are the British would have lost, and there would be no Battle of Waterloo. Instead, a great stroke of luck came Wellington's way when the heavens opened up delivering one of the most memorable and fortuitous rainstorms in the history of warfare. It's the greatest deluge that anyone has, has seen. Uh, it comes down in sheets. Uh, hands can't be seen just in front of the face. And so this torrent stops any chance for the French to begin a battle. The rains immediately rendered all roads impassable due to mud and forced the day of the big battle to the 18th. Yet Napoleon's spirits were high. Even though blunders had been made in these preliminary battles, the French ruled the day. He had achieved his objective of driving a wedge even farther between the Prussian and British armies. Yet he underestimated the Prussians and the recovering Blücher. Although they had been defeated on the 16th, Napoleon was wrong in thinking they were through. He had no idea of how much Blücher hated him and hated France. Rather than completely retreating from the area, the Prussians were regrouping. During the stormy night of the 17th, Wellington received word that Blücher was prepared to move heaven and earth in order to get his army to the battlefield at Waterloo the next day. Wellington has taken the measure. He's met Blucher before. He's taken the measure of the man. And when this old uh, cavalryman says that he's going to be there, Wellington believes it. And that seals his decision to go ahead and stay in his, his position and face Napoleon at Waterloo on the 18th. This was a huge gamble for Wellington. If Blucher failed on his promise, the odds were that Napoleon's more experienced army could defeat his. The clock was ticking. June 18th, after a night of almost ceaseless rain, British and French troops met the dawn at Waterloo. At about 10 o'clock, the rain stopped, giving many of the men their first clear view of the killing field. It is one of the great ironies of history that Wellington was already acquainted with this land and was already familiar with its unique features. As a young boy, before he went to Angers, he spent some time in Brussels, and Waterloo is very close to Brussels. It's a, an area that he knew well. He'd scouted it. In fact, he said at the time that he had picked this ground earlier and kept it in his pocket. To the untrained eye, the lay of the land looks nearly flat. But Wellington knew this to be almost an optical illusion for it was really rolling hills. This cagey observation would have an enormous impact on the way the battle finally played out. Thus, the first move in this great military chess game went to Wellington. It was a vitally important move, for he was the commander who maneuvered himself into the position of choosing the battlefield. And he had also succeeded in luring Napoleon into fighting on it. Finally, now, after 46 years, the two grand masters of war would meet. Wellington, of course, knew and respected Bonaparte's reputation as a military genius. As a man, though, his respect fell off. He never underestimated him as a soldier. He had a great... Uh admiration for his capabilities as a soldier. Um, I don't think he uh, really approved of him in many ways, his conduct towards others. He didn't think he was an honorable man. In many ways, he didn't think he was a gentleman in, in the true sense of the word. Little is known of Bonaparte's opinion of Wellington, the man. As a soldier, though, his opinion was firm. At breakfast the morning of the battle, Napoleon tongue-lashed his officers who had lost to Wellington in Spain. Just because Wellington has defeated you, you think he is a great general. 
I tell you Wellington is a bad general, that the English are bad troops, and that this is going to be a picnic. Napoleon Bonaparte. It was with this feeling of confidence and invincibility that Napoleon rode out to the battlefield. This confidence was also born of the fact that he was sure the Prussians were out of the picture and Wellington was his only foe for the day. He had even sent 33,000 troops to shadow the Prussians' activities. In his mind and in the eyes of his troops, he was still the greatest commander since Alexander the Great, perhaps even greater. It seemed never to have crossed his mind that his opponent, the Duke of Wellington, had never lost a major campaign. Although the rain had stopped, it continued to be a major factor here, especially for the French. The ground was completely saturated with water. Until the battlefield dried out, French artillery would be rendered totally useless. Cannonballs during this era of warfare did not explode. Instead, they ricocheted off the ground, acting like fiery bowling balls that plowed into enemy lines. Under the present conditions, Napoleon knew his shots would be ineffective as the cannonballs would become mired in mud rather than bouncing along the battlefield. He decided to wait for the ground to dry. For hours, the two armies faced each other, the tension mounting, the clock ticking. Unknown to Napoleon, this delay was giving the distant Prussians 10 miles away time to regroup. Finally, at 11.25 a.m., Bonaparte ordered his artillery to open fire. The French artillery was the greatest in the world. The former artilleryman Napoleon always saw to that. Yet Wellington was ready for them. His choice of the battlefield was perfect to defend against cannon attack because of the rolling hills. Wellington had cleverly hid half his army from Napoleon's view. This tactic was known as reverse slopes and was something Wellington had perfected in Spain. It was one of the major reasons that he had lured the French to this unique spot at Waterloo. Wellington would hide them behind folds in the hillside. Not only would this mean that the enemy couldn't be quite sure exactly how many troops he had or where they were, but if they fired artillery at them, which was of course the standard way of uh, uh, killing troops at uh, great distances, uh, the cannonballs were not going to hit them. In any case, if they couldn't see them, they didn't know whether they were hitting them or not. At the same time, French troops moved upon Allied troops located in the Chateau of Hougamont, located in a strategic corner of the battlefield. This move was meant as a simple diversionary tactic, but soon blew up into a full-scale operation. For the rest of this day, the battle would rage, becoming like an open wound, hemorrhaging French blood and siphoning off much-needed troops. Perhaps even more important at this time was what was happening with Field Marshal Blücher and the Prussian army. Napoleon had sent troops to tell Blücher to make sure the Prussians kept their distance from the main battle. Not needing a victory here, Blücher cleverly used just a portion of his army for engaging the French and then slipped away with the rest of his men to aid Wellington. I can't stress too much the courage, the moral courage that uh, Blücher, the Prussian commander, had in order to march to Wellington. He could very easily have decided he had already borne his brunt. Blücher immediately ran into a catastrophic problem, though, for he hadn't fully anticipated the ordeal that would ensue when he tried to move tens of thousands of men cannons and horses along 10 miles of road clogged with rivers of mud. 
Serious doubts were now raised as to whether Blucher would be able to keep his promise to Wellington. At about 1.30, a determined Napoleon unleashed the full force of his fabled infantry on the center of the British line. Divide and conquer was always at the heart of his battle strategies. Facing a hail of fire from the British rifles, 16,000 French troops reached the crest of the hill and nearly broke through the British line. The fighting here was as ferocious as ever recorded in Napoleonic warfare. The sound of bullets against the breastplates of the French was like a hailstorm against a window. British soldier. Just at the most crucial moment, like in some schoolboy's fantasy battle, the British cavalry came to the rescue. These are big men on big horses, and they smash through the French infantry, driving it back in great disorder. This is probably the Britain's greatest cavalry charge uh, of the entire Napoleonic Wars. The fact that Wellington continued to hold his line together against superior French forces was a testament to his skills. All the lessons he had learned in Spain were paying off now. One of the things you learn in warfare is that after you're victorious, year after year after year, the enemy learns what your strengths are and then learns not to make those mistakes anymore. So now the Prussians nor the British forces are falling into the old traps that Napoleon used to set for them. They know that he wants to divide and defeat in detail. They will not divide. Both Napoleon and Wellington were renowned for brilliant battle strategies. Yet here at Waterloo, the great attacker met the great defender and canceled each other out. Soon finesse went out the window and the conflict became what Wellington called a pounding match. He remained very cool. He's supposed to have said uh, when things were very bad, he said to some of the infantry, Hard pounding gentlemen, we'll see who pound the longest, you know. Now Napoleon received worth, the Prussians had been spotted miles away, marching toward the battle. Lucca and his troops were doing the impossible. At first, Bonaparte was unbelieving, but then reality set in. He would now have to fight the rest of the day with one eye over his shoulder. This still did not shake him, though. Always the gambler. His army had fought out of tougher spots before. He still firmly believed that if he could beat the British, he would also be able to turn his army around and defeat the Prussians on the same afternoon. He had defeated two armies before on numerous occasions. The only thing he knew he couldn't do was fight them both simultaneously. Time was getting tight. It was imperative now that he dispose of the British immediately. Napoleon's primary battlefield commander was Marshal Ney. Even though Ney had blundered earlier in his encounter with Wellington at Quatre Bras, Napoleon still left him in charge of operations. Ney was the kind of leader whose men would follow him into hell. And that is what they now did. For he erred again when he perceived a movement in Wellington's line as being a withdrawal. Smelling blood, he ordered a massive cavalry charge against the British without the aid of artillery or infantry support. Wave after wave of French cavalry charged. 16,000 horses and riders in all. The scene was one of uncontrollable frenzy and movement. A surreal moment of warfare. No man present could have forgotten in the afterlife the awful grandeur of the charge. An overwhelming, long-moving line, ever-advancing, glittering like a stormy wave of the sea when it catches the sunlight. The very earth seemed to vibrate beneath the thundering hooves. British soldier. Yet it was a mistake. 
Wellington had not been withdrawing, only readjusting. The British quickly formed their troops into infantry squares and braced for the onslaught. This porcupine defense was extremely effective because Ney had made the mistake of not supporting his cavalry charges with infantry and artillery protection. The British successfully thwarted the charges, but the price on both sides was viciously high. The battlefield was now filled with dead bodies, and tension was mounting even higher. One British soldier described the scene. I had never heard of a battle in which everybody was killed, but this seemed to be the exception, as all are going in turns. By four o'clock, the Prussians began to emerge, and by five, they had taken over a nearby village and had started to tear into the right flank of Napoleon's army. The main portion of their forces was still to come, but Napoleon now had to siphon off thousands of reserves to halt the initial group. Things were definitely going Wellington's way. He had so far successfully blocked every one of the French maneuvers. Wellington was having a, um, a typical Wellingtonian day. He knew what had to be done, he knew where he needed to be, and that's where he was. Staff officers were falling all around him. Uh, he was, as usual, in the midst of shot and shell, but again, miraculously, Nothing touched him. For Napoleon, it was different. For the first time on a battlefield, he seemed indecisive, even lethargic. He and Wellington were both 46, but Wellington seemed young at 46, Napoleon old. Controversy has raged forever about the state of Napoleon's health on that day. Is he simply sick and going back to uh... To, to rest and recover some energy to come back. Napoleon's been on active campaign for all of his adult life. I mean, this guy has, has done more so, crammed more into his 46 years than any comparable man of the, of the age. It would be hard to find a man in history who's had such an active life. Wellington knew, though, that like a wounded animal backed against a wall, Napoleon might be most dangerous when cornered. Wellington also knew Napoleon had a potential knockout punch in reserve, the Imperial Guard. The Imperial Guard, especially the Old Guard, are men who have served extremely violently. They've, they've all won awards for, for valor in their previous fights. Uh, they've never been defeated. On every battlefield when Napoleon's had to administer the coup de grace, it's the Old Guard that's done it for him. Although he was using part of the guard to fend off the Prussians on his flank, he still had not called the main body of their troops into action. This may be one indication that he was still positive about winning the battle. Perhaps the most strategic spot on the battlefield was a farmhouse called La Aison, held by the Allies. Still not using the Imperial Guard, Napoleon ordered Ney to take it at all costs. Ney finally did something right when he properly coordinated an infantry, cavalry, and artillery attack on the building driving the Allies out. Was Napoleon going to accomplish the impossible again? For all practical purposes, the battle was now even, still there to be won or lost. Suddenly, it was Wellington who was in crisis. By losing the farmhouse and being weakened by the French cavalry charges, the center of his main line was now vulnerable. The battle was so close now that Wellington told one of his men, give me Blücher or give me the knight. There comes a decisive moment in every battle and in every life, a moment when one decision can make or break everything. That moment had now come for Napoleon. It had been a long and amazing road he had traveled from Corsica to Waterloo. Whether he would continue down that victorious road all boiled down to one decision he made now. Ney requested the Imperial Guard 
to finish the job against Wellington. Napoleon refused him. Troops? Huh. Where do you expect me to find them? Do you think I can manufacture some? Napoleon Bonaparte. Perhaps Napoleon was right in refusing him. Ney had made too many errors in judgment during the campaign. The failure at Quatre Bras, the disastrous cavalry charges. Napoleon no longer had confidence in his judgment. In making this decision, Napoleon let slip away perhaps his best chance for victory. This allowed Wellington enough time to regroup. Instead, Napoleon used a portion of the guard to check the Prussians on his flank. This maneuver took less than an hour. Then he turned to a last ditch stand against Wellington. He knew he had to succeed now because the bulk of the Prussian army would be there at any time. At seven o'clock, Napoleon led the mighty Imperial Guard out himself. He led them in person until his staff persuaded him that no, he must not put himself in jeopardy, that even if they won the battle, if he were killed, then everything they'd been fighting for would be at an end. And so he turned them over to Ney to march on Wellington. Wellington's deployed troops were in place. They were behind the reverse slope. They were laying down. They were loaded. Everything that he could do, he had done. Dusk was falling as the French marched forward up the ridge. The future of France was on the line, and the fate of Europe for the next 100 years. The British silently held their place. Wellington was right there with them. He chose a position alongside one of his finest generals, Peregrine Maitland. Here was defeat coming right towards them. But they were coming on in column. As long as they kept in column, there was a chance. And as the French Imperial Guard column reached the top of the slope. Wellington, who was there by the guards, shouted, now Maitland, now's your time. can't take it. They take the pounding initially, they move forward, uh, men step forward in ranks. The discipline is incredible. These are Napoleon's best troops, uh, but the pounding is just too much. The guards retreating. It's never happened. This doesn't happen. The Imperial Guard had never been defeated. And as the, as the Imperial Guard went back, all this great enthusiasm that the rest of the French army had felt was turned back on them because now the guard was retreating and the French army just began to disintegrate. Next, the British infantry charged. Outmaneuvered, outgunned, and outgeneraled. Panic ensued as the French broke ranks and ran. At the same time, the bulk of the Prussian army arrived and flooded the field. It was hopeless for Napoleon to attempt to regroup. Under the protection of the guard, he abandoned the field and headed back to Paris. Blücher and Wellington met and congratulated each other with great exuberance. Later, Wellington would call the battle the nearest run thing you ever saw in your life. As the sun went down, darkness engulfed Napoleon's army and his dream. On this day, he left 50,000 dead or wounded in his wake. In his abandoned coach, they found a declaration of victory already printed that he intended to distribute that night in Brussels. Yet it was Wellington who had won the Battle of Titans. 
In the end, Wellington won the Battle of Waterloo because he outgeneraled Napoleon. Napoleon was great. He had a great mind. But there at Waterloo, all of that seemed to desert him. And it was as if everything that was drained from Napoleon was fed into Wellington. Wellington did not put a foot wrong. He had all the troops where he needed them, when he needed them. His ally, Blucher, turned up on time as he had promised. Everything worked. The effect of the battle would reverberate around the globe for almost a century to come. France, diminishing in influence. Britain and Prussia, rising. On June 22nd, 1815, Napoleon abdicated the throne again and was banished to the tiny island of St. Helena in the South Atlantic. He would spend six desolate, desperate years here before his death on May 5th, 1821. Wellington went on to become Prime Minister of England. As the years went by, he became one of Britain's greatest father figures, referred to by all as simply the Duke. The world paid court to him at his fabulous London home of Apsley House and his country estate of Stratfield Say. Wellington died in 1852. His body rests today front and center amongst Britain's greatest national heroes at St. Paul's Cathedral in London. In 1840, Napoleon's body was brought back to Paris from St. Helena. According to his will, he wanted to be buried in France. As the country's greatest hero, he rests today in a setting of spectacular glory at the Church of the Dome in the Hotel des Amolines. Fame is a capricious mistress. Centuries come and go and few men are remembered. Millenniums follow and even fewer are recalled. Yet there are no restrictions in the Hall of Fame. Evil men and good men are equally welcome. Napoleon is a charter member of this elite club, the ultimate dual personality. Simultaneously, a prince of peace and a god of war. His deeds were many, and his memory will be with us forever. His name linked with greatness, malevolence, and a word, Waterloo.